If the Apostle Paul walked through the streets of our town, he would surely say to us, I perceive that you are very religious in every way, because just like the Athenians, our culture worships all sorts of gods. But like the Apostle Paul, we as Christians stand opposed to these other gods, affirming the truth of the first commandment, that we should have no other gods before the one true God. Kirk Brothers is the president-elect of Heritage Christian University, and in this lesson, he helps us think about the first commandment. Today I want us to talk about the marriage on the mountain. I've had the privilege to be able to work with couples as they're getting ready for their weddings and their marriages. I've had the privilege of doing a number of wedding ceremonies and been able to do those in some interesting places. One that comes to mind is I remember being able to do a ceremony with two of my former students in college that I had had in class. We'd also worship together at the same congregation while they were in college and even post-college. And they had their wedding on the shores of Lake Tahoe. So literally, you've got the, the audience in front of us. You've got stone walkway coming down to the edge of the water. And behind me is Lake Tahoe. And it was one of the most beautiful places that I've ever been able to have the privilege of doing a wedding. We're going to focus in our lesson today on a wedding. But it's not a wedding at the side of Lake Tahoe, but it is at an amazing place. It is going to be a wedding on a mountain, and it's going to be a mountain that is literally exploding, billowing up with fire and smoke. As we're focusing on the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments, literally it would be the Ten Words or the Ten Sayings. The Ten Commandments go by several different names and phrases in the Bible. The Commandments, the Ten Commandments, the Covenant. Some others are the words of the covenant, the tablets of the covenant, simply the tablets, the testimony, etc. Most of us know them by the phrase, the Ten Commandments. I have a different phrase that I use for them, and I want us to talk a little bit about them today. We're focusing in particular on the first of those commandments. But as we focus on that, I think it's very important that we look at it inside of its overall setting. I want us to think about what is happening here, the significance of what is happening here. I describe Exodus chapters 19 and 20 as the marriage on the mountain. And you have in chapter 19 the proposal and at the end of chapter 20 and then, or excuse me, the end of chapter 19 and then into chapter 20, you have the ceremony. So let's talk about that just a little bit. As you look at chapter 19, you're going to see Moses is kind of the go-between between God and the, the bride-to-be, the, the fiancé-to-be, if you will, which is the nation of Israel. In chapter 19, God is delivering a proposal but Moses is the one who's actually delivering the proposal. Now, as, as I read this, I can't help but... ...or high or maybe even elementary, and you, you weren't sure about how to talk to her about it. You can think about probably elementary school is a better analogy, where you'd have a friend that would say, you'd say, hey, would you deliver this note for me? And you, the girl would open the note and it'd be from you, delivered by a mutual friend, and it said, I like you, do you like me, check yes or no. Well, as we look at our story, it's a little bit more mature than what we did in elementary school, but basically Moses is the go-between between, between God and Israel. God is the most powerful being in all of the universe. You do not simply walk up to him, and that's something we're going to see as we move to the end of chapter 19 and into chapter 20. And so Moses is the go-between. He is going to represent God to the people and people to God. So as the proposal is delivered, in fact, let me mention this as an aside, you'll notice as you look really from chapter 19 through chapter 34, Moses goes up and down the mountain multiple times. 
I identified at least seven times, it looks like to me, reading through the text, that Moses went up and down the mountain. And I just mention that because often we kind of think about that one moment where he goes up for 40 days on the mountain, and it's actually one of many as he is communicating to the people God's will. With that in mind, let's talk for just a moment about the proposal. I'd like to read chapter 19, beginning in verse 5. Now then, if you indeed will obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. God is asking them to be his people. He is committing to be their God. Now, he's brought them out of the land of Egypt. If you were to back up into verse 4, he says, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. What God is saying is he is reminding them that he loves them and that he has shown them that he loves them. He showed how much he loved them by delivering them out of the land of Egypt. And so having shown to them that he loves them, reminding them of a specific example, actually a series of examples that are proof that he really truly does love them, he is trying to make a commitment to them. He wants this more than a, to be more than just a temporary relationship. He doesn't want just to deliver them from Egypt. He wants to be in a relationship with them forever. And so he says, I want you to be my people. You will be my people and I will be your God. I will be committed to you. I've already shown that I'm committed to you. And now I'm going to ask you to be committed to me. Now, as he talks about that commitment, along with that commitment comes the need for them to listen to him and to obey his voice. He says, indeed, obey my voice and keep my covenant. And what he tells us is not only that he wants them to be in a relationship with him, he's not only proposing a commitment between them, but he lets us know that this commitment, this proposal has a purpose. Here's what I mean. If you look in verse 6, it says, And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. What I want you to think about is, I've had people say to me over the years, and I'll be honest with you, I I would guess younger in my life, it would be an apt description to say that I always kind of struggled with the fact that God just picked the Jews and wonder why he picked the Jews and, and didn't choose other people. And I have had, in addition to that, people say to me, you know, God picked the Jews, he loved the Jews, and he didn't love anyone else. Well, the reality is, if we look at the proposal as described in Exodus chapter 19, verses 4 through 6, God did not pick Israel because he didn't love the rest of the world or to exclude the rest of the world. He says from the very beginning, you are a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Now, he calls them to be a holy nation because he is a holy God. He is other, set apart, pure. And you find, for example, all over and over throughout the book of Leviticus, you have this call, be holy as I the Lord your God am holy. You can, an example of that would be Leviticus chapter 19 verse 2. But that's a common refrain in that book. He is a holy God and he needs his people to be a holy people, to walk in his ways and to model him. Now, not only should they model him because their relationship with him, but they should model him because they are a kingdom of priests. Now, priests represent God to the world. Priests are mediators, go-betweens between God and people. In other words, when God says to the Israelites, you're going to be a kingdom of priests, he says, you are to be in a relationship with me so that you can help the world to know me so that you can represent me to the world so that you can reach out to be a model of what it means to be holy like me help them to know me so that the rest of the world 
can be in a relationship with me. The job of Israel was to function like priests. They were to help others to know God, to be mediators between their own power and strength and beauty. They thought it was all about them and the relationship with God. And when I say they, I'm talking about many, though by no means all, because there are many Jews down through the history of the Israelites who have been faithful to God, who understood the purpose of the proposal and have lived out that purpose. But there are many, many others who failed to remember that when God called them to be his people and to be in a relationship with him, a part of that proposal was that he wanted them to be priests to reach out to the rest of the world. So we have the proposal. Moses delivered to the pro proposal to the people. The people said yes. They said all that God has said we will do. And so God began to make arrangements for the ceremony. He told the people to prepare. He told them to get ready for his coming down upon the mountain. He set markers around the mountain and they weren't to touch the mountain. You see, when God comes into the presence of frail, fallen, and broken human beings, when the most powerful being in the universe comes among us, it is a very dangerous thing for us. I remember years ago, one of my former professors in graduate school said, taking an all-powerful and holy God and putting him in the middle of a sinful people it's kind of like putting a cook stove in the middle of a fireworks display. You do it very, very carefully. And so God was very specific about what he wanted them to do to get ready for his coming. Now when the ceremony happened, God came in all his splendor and all his glory. I want you to think of the most beautiful wedding that you've ever seen the most, uh, the most beautiful dress that you've ever seen. Uh, I want you to think of the uh, handsome tux. I want you to think of the entourage and how they're dressed. Just picture in your mind the most beautiful thing you've seen at a wedding. Hold that in your mind as we look at Exodus chapter 19. Because Exodus chapter 19, beginning in verse 16, describes God coming down on the mountain in all of his glory. Here's what it says. So it came about on the third day when it was morning that there were thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they stood at the foot of, Mount, of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked violently. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him with thunder. Literally, when God came down to earth, when the presence of God came down on Mount Sinai, it was as if the mountaintop exploded. It was as if the earth could not contain his presence. I want you to hear the sound of thunder and see the literally in Scripture represents the presence of God. When the children of Israel went out of Egypt, it was a fiery pillar that guided them by night. You have the burning bush that burned but did not burn up where God's presence called Moses to go into Egypt and lead his people out. When we get over into Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the Passover, just shortly after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, when the church is established on that day, when Peter preached that powerful sermon that led to 3,000 conversions, it says the Holy Spirit came down on the heads of the apostles in the form of tongues of fire. Because consistently in Scripture, the presence of God is marked by fire. And so it's appropriate that fire billowed up from the top of the mountain. God is sending a message. 
This is no arbitrary relationship that they are entering into. This is a relationship with the creator of all that is. The most powerful being in existence and everything that exists came from him. This is the God of the plagues. This is the God who parted the sea. The God on the mountain is more powerful than they can imagine. And if they are going to enter into a relationship with him, then they need to take it very, very seriously. You'll notice if you look in chapter 20 and verse 2, before he goes into the Ten Commandments, the Ten Wedding Vows, he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Now, when I conduct a wedding ceremony, there are usually, or in fact, there are always wedding vows. I'll usually say we are gathered here in the presence of God and these witnesses to witness the vows of this man and this woman, the joining of this man and this woman. And in that ceremony, there will be some kind of question. There will be some kind of exchange of vows. There will be a problem. The vows are a statement of the level of commitment that the two people are making to each other. That if they're rich, they're still in. If they're poor, they're going to stay together. If they're healthy, they're committed. If they're not healthy, they're still committed. Now, unfortunately, far too many times, couples make that commitment to each other, but they don't mean it. I pray that's not true of our relationship with God. When we look at Exodus chapter 20, I don't describe the things that are found there as the Ten Commandments. I describe them as the Ten Wedding Vows. And I think if we will begin to view them as the wedding vows for God's ceremony, it will radically transform how we view them and even how we view our Christian lives. Because at the heart of our life in Christ, is a relationship. When you look at these 10 sayings, don't view them as commandments. Oh, I've got to do this to go to heaven. I've got to avoid this if I, if I don't want to be cast into the place of torment. Instead of viewing them as a list of do's and don'ts, view them as the promises that were made by Israel to God during their wedding ceremony. If you look at the commandments that are there, it begins with, you shall have no other gods before me in verse 3. The first four commandments are all about the relationship between God and Israel. I'm reminded of Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 and following, where you have the two great commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. I believe that those two commandments are the core of everything in Scripture and ultimately they lie behind, behind the Ten Commandments. You see, the first four commandments are expressions of the command to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. You see, they're all about God. He says, have no other gods before me. He says, make no graven images. He says, do not take my name in vain. He says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. They're all about a relationship with God. And basically, all God is doing is he is asking from Israel nothing more than any spouse would ask of the person who is marrying them. If you wanted to put those four commandments in, in modern terms, he is basically saying to his bride, don't be with any other men or in this case don't be with any other god don't have pictures of any other man in your purse or on the mantle don't do things that would destroy my name take time for me god puts it this way don't have other gods before me don't have images of other gods don't misuse my name and set aside a day each week that's devoted completely to me. It's just normal. It's just what a God who is in love with his people asks of his people. And it's what a people 
who are in love with God ought to do in devotion to Him. Then if you look at the other six of the commandments, they are expansions of that second great commandment to love your neighbor as yourself as it talks about not murdering, not committing adultery, not stealing, not coveting, etc. And it's saying basically that if we're going to be in a relationship with God, if a relationship is going to last, we need to share values in common. I often tell couples when they're getting married, you're not going to be alike. You're going, you may be very different. Often opposites attract. But if you don't have some core values in common, this marriage isn't going to last very long. And so what God is saying is we need to share some, some common values. You see, in a marriage, if you've got one that thinks it's okay to, to shoot people, murder people, and rob banks, and the other thinks those are terrible ideas, they don't share common values that are going to allow that marriage to last. And basically, God is saying in the latter part of those commandments that He is faithful, that He honors others, that he is giving, that he does not steal, he does not lie, and therefore we should honor our parents. We should honor our commitments to our spouse. We should not lie. We should not steal. We should not covet. You see, what I want us to see is at its heart, it's about a relationship. If we take this and we apply it to ourselves and we think, what can we learn from God's marriage with Israel? The first thing I want us to realize is that God uses the same language of the church that he used of Israel. If you look in 1 Peter, you're going to find in 1 Peter chapter 2 it says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. God, when he married Israel, when he proposed to Israel, he said, I need you to be a kingdom of priests to represent me to the world. And it's very easy for us to look back and say, hey, they forgot the purpose of the proposal. They didn't represent God very well. But then when I look in 1 Peter, I find that, the God's, that God says the same thing about us. If we're a part of his church, he calls us a royal priesthood. That means our job is not just to show up on Sunday and enjoy our cushioned pews and our climate-controlled buildings and enjoy the fact we're going to heaven but our job is to represent God in the world and to be priests who bring the world to God. The second thing I want us to remember by way of application is that at the end of the day, what we do in Christ is about a relationship. If you were to take the 600 plus commandments in the Bible, for the most part, they boil down to these 10 vows, which boil down to the two great commandments in Matthew 22, which boil down to one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I want to challenge each of us to let our Christian lives not be about, not to be about a list of do's and don'ts, some commands that become oppressive. But our Christian lives should be just natural outflowings of being in a loving, believing relationship with the God that loves us enough that he gave his son on the cross of Calvary. You see, I don't need a law to tell me to be faithful to Cindy Brothers. Because I love her with all of my heart. And when you love somebody, you're faithful to them, you honor them, you love them. ceremony and we entered into a relationship with God and so that changes everything let us love him the way he deserves and the way he has loved us as the deer thirsts for the water Lord, for the water, Lord so my soul so longs after you Yes, my soul. Yes, my soul.